Hello, my name is Laurent James Harrison. As part of the Gaga Critical Intervention Lab, I will present my work in progress. Is traditional Japanese culture transnational? Let me begin by thanking Professor Fabio Rambelli for all his work in organizing this conference and seeing it through even with the various difficulties that the pandemic has brought his way. Equally, I would like to thank all of the presenters, those in Japan, those in America and those in Europe for presenting and creating this unique opportunity to discuss Gagaku. And lastly, let me thank all of you who are listening to this and the other presentations for participating in this conference remotely. Let me begin my presentation by explaining why I posed that particular question. Is traditional Japanese culture transnational? The titular question actually draws upon an earlier work, Jennifer Suchland's Is Post-Socialism Transnational? In that article, Suchland poses her titular question to consider how Eurasian women are absented from discussions of transnationalism. In reading her work, I recognized a parallel between the Eurasian women and their absence from transnationalism, transnationalism she presents and gaku and other traditional Japanese arts such as shakuhachi, shamisen, koto, and their absence from discussions of transnationalism. This parallel was compounded with an observation regarding the root word transnational. Transnational, at its core, describes something that has moved beyond, which is what the meaning of the prefix trans carries, the national context. This description seems to fit all of the above arts, having moved beyond Japan and its national context, and yet not being labeled transnational. These two facts raise the question that drives this project. For this presentation, I'd like to begin by looking at the one moment where discussions of traditional Japanese arts as transnational or not as transnational appear. The problems that appear within these discussions will help to indicate what we really need to do to discuss traditional arts in a way that is more in tune with what is actually happening with them. I'll then conclude with presenting an initial sketch of my approach in light of these observations. The discussion of traditional Japanese cultural arts in relationship to transnationality appeared in the 2000s and only in the context of Japanese studies, not in the context of transnationality. In this moment, there were two works that presented both sides of the topic. The Kahn argument, arguing that these arts were not transnational, was advanced by Koichi Iwabuchi in his book, Recentering Globalization. The pro argument for traditional cultural arts being seen as transnational was advanced by Stephen Cassano in his work From Fukushu to Udebu. What I want to do is to look at each argument, illustrate the problems that each argument makes in his presentation with respect to pro or con on the argument, and then to look at the common problem between the two sides that speaks to a larger problem within transnationalism. First, let me discuss Iwabuchi's argument against traditional Japanese arts being transnational. At the core of his argument are two terms. The first term is transnationalism, which he gives the following definition that appears on screen. The important thing to recognize within this definition is the notion that whatever is moving, be it people, commodities, or ideas, have the potential to weaken the importance of the national border with their crossing. The more these things cross, and the faster these things cross the border, the less significance the border has. This is the central tenet of Iwabuchi's description of transnationalism. Gagaku and other traditional arts don't move with the scale that Iwabuchi talks about. They cross the national border but not with the speed Iwabuchi associates with transnationalism. Furthermore, they still can be identified with Japan even after they cross the border. 
Iwabuji would argue that based on these two points, they are not transnational. He then goes on to advance a second term, trans-slash-nationalism. Rather than being transnational, Gaaku and other Japanese arts are trans-slash-national to Iwabuchi, meaning they are being put out and crossing the national border in order to serve as an obstacle to the transnationality central to his discussion. In other words, they are making the crossing to hinder, stop, or divert transnationalism by reasserting the national point of view. There is some validity to Iwabuchi's assertion. The Japanese government does deploy traditional cultural arts as symbols of the nation state, especially in some performances of traditional Japanese cultural arts abroad. However, Iwabuchi's assertion of trans-slash-nationalism feels like an, it overreaches to ascribe a goal to the movement of traditional Japanese cultural arts. This is largely because he never considers what the actual performers themselves are thinking. What may be applicable, what may be an applicable goal behind the Japanese government's deployment of arts may not be in the minds of the people engaging in these performances. Furthermore, Iwabuchi doesn't consider the fact that a number of traditional Japanese arts have already been outside of Japan for at least 40 years, if not longer. This is because his focus is on the dissolution of the significance around the national border in the present moment. So the fundamental problem with Iwabuchi's argument is the myopia of focusing on movement that lessens the significance of the Japanese national border and his failure to accurately describe the movement of traditional Japanese arts outside of Japan. Let me transition now to Kasano's argument for traditional Japanese cultural arts being transnational. Kasano himself is not a scholar. He is a shakuhachi player. So this automatically points to the fact that he does not do as deep an analysis as Iwabuchi does. At the core of his article is his examination of how the shakuhachi spread outside of Japan, primarily to the United States, Australia, and Europe. The way he makes his case is that he presents a history of Japanese shakuhachi masters traveling outside of Japan to give performances and instruction, and the non-Japanese students who travel to Japan, become teachers, then go on to spread the shakuhachi abroad. The central premise of Kasano's argument is that between the Japanese shakuhachi masters traveling outside of Japan and the non-Japanese students traveling to and from Japan to learn and then spread the shakuhachi, there is movement that demonstrates the qualification for transnationality. The above movement shows in Kasano's mind that the national boundary of Japan is not significant as both parties do not regard it with much significance in their travels on both sides of the boundary. Much like Iwabuchi, there's truth in Kasano's argument, but to simply present that fact and leave it is not enough on a scholarly level. Kasano never delves into what these travels mean to both practitioners who are engaging in these travels, as well as the audience in the places that they travel to for performances. Furthermore, Kasano never really thinks about the relationships amongst the teachers, especially in the case of foreign students traveling to Japan for a teaching license and then leaving Japan to teach abroad. In this situation, what is the relationship between the teacher in Japan and the practitioner outside of Japan? The same question is true for the Japanese instructor who goes abroad and then goes back to Japan. What are the relationships that have been created because of these travels? 
And what is the relationship of that Japanese master to students abroad? The last point I want to cover in the Iwabuchi Kasano discourse is the one thing they share in common, the term transnational flow. Both authors use this term, but the fact that both use flow to argue opposite sides of the argument raises the question, how can this metaphor of flow be deployed both for the con and the pro sides of the argument? Furthermore, transnational flow is frequently deployed throughout transnational discourse, so that raises another question. If, in this particular case, you see a problem with the term, how many times does the problem with this term appear in the larger transnational discourse? Scholars are aware of the problematic usage of flow and have written about it. Perhaps the best description of the problem is given by Mary Louise Pratt in her chapter in the book, Images of Power. In that chapter, she gives six problems with flow and its usage in transnational discourse. In that chapter, she gives six problems with flow and its usage in transnational discourse. For the sake of time, I'll focus on a few of the six points rather than go over all of them. The first point is one that she makes after the later five, and that is flow imparts a positive valence. Flow and its positive valence is the key to understanding how flow can be used both by Kasano and Iwabuchi for opposing sides of the argument. At the core of the issue is seeing the object depicted as flowing with a positive value. In Iwabuchi's case, he discusses Japanese TV programs and anime in terms of flowing and gives those things positive valence. Traditional Japanese cultural arts, on the other hand, are given a negative valence. In Kasano's case, flow goes the other way. Kasano says that flow of the flow of shakuhachi out of Japan is a positive thing. Between Kasano and Iwabuchi's usage of flow, it is apparent that the placement of the positive valence lacks objectivity and is more likely to be subject to the interpreter's reading. The second problem of not distinguishing types of movement is particularly apropos in the discussion of why the movement of gagaku and other traditional arts have been overlooked. The movement Iwabuchi focuses on is the movement of Japanese TV programs and media. The movement of gagaku and other traditional arts is different and as such is in a negative sense to Iwabuchi. Contingent with this observation of different types of movement is Pratt's fifth point of human agency and intentionality. This best describes how Gagaku came to the U.S. The agency of people like Shamoto Suyoshi Sensei and Togisunu Inobu Sensei to travel to Hawaii and California to teach is how Gagaku began in these places post-World War II. I think this is the biggest point to make. Any of these arts move because people move and carry these arts with them. That is something we need to examine that the transnationalist discourse does not always pay attention to. Lastly, flow comes with the assumption that there will be an equilibrium established at the end. This description does not necessarily describe the way to think about 
what is going on with the movement of garaku and other traditional arts outside of Japan. These arts move, then encounter a period of struggle to get things up and running and have practitioners come in and learn. The struggle to establish shakuhachi abroad is not presented in Kasano's argument. These four points need to be discussed when we think about what is going on with the movement of gagaku and other traditional Japanese arts outside of Japan. Having presented these problematic points, I'd like to go over in the last few minutes my current understanding of how Dagaku has moved out of Japan. I won't be able to go into a deep dive of my ideas due to time constraints. The first thing I feel we need to address are two questions. One, what exactly is moving? And two, what does movement consist of? If you've read my article, Gagaku in Place and Practice, or if you paid attention to the title, you probably know what the answer to my first question is. What I'm thinking, what I think is moving is a practice. The concept of practice I'm employing is Todd May's conception. May defines a practice as regularities of behavior usually goal-directed, that are socially normatively governed. For those of you who have not read my article or are hearing this idea for the first time, let me rephrase that definition. A practice is things people do on a regular basis, i.e. the regularities of behavior, that they do these things for some aim or goal, i.e. goal-directedness. Within these things that people do on a regular basis, there are roles people engage in, i.e. the social governance, and they also have right and wrong ways of engaging in the actions, i.e. the normative governance. To illustrate this with Gagaku as the example, the regularities of behavior would be practicing, that is going over, the instrument, the dances, and the vocal music. The goal directedness would be to perform the music and dances before an audience. This is a goal that Gagaku shares with shakuhachi and other traditional Japanese musical forms. The social governance appears in roles such as the ondo, the lead musician of each instrument who plays the netori, the kuto, the lead vocalist who sings the opening part of vocal music, the dancers, in all of the different instruments. Lastly, the normative governance of Gagaku can be seen in the right and wrong ways to play the instruments, the right and wrong ways of performing vocal music, and the right and wrong ways of dancing, all of which one learns over time. One thing May points out is that a practice is part of the identity of the practitioner. They become part of who you are, that is, part of your identity. So rather than as Iwabuchi describes it, by saying people, people and ideas move, I would argue practice, practices move, but they do so as part of the people who engage in them moving. That is, practices do not move independent of people. They are part of the people who are moving across the border. Now, let me address the second question. What is movement and how should we understand it without using the metaphor of flow? To answer that question, I draw upon the work of Tim Cresswell, the British geography scholar. In his book, On the Move, mobility in the Western world, he defines movement as, quote, an act of displacement that allows people to move between locations, end quote. I have to alter that definition by adding to an act of displacement, the phrase and subsequent emplacement, 
and to people the phrase pract and practices. Displacement and emplacement are concepts that the American philosopher Edward Casey develops in his work on place. Whereas displacement points to the severing of ties with the site of departure, emplacement indicates the creation of ties with the new location. I would argue that both displacement and emplacement are involved in the movement of gaku and other Japanese cultural practices as they must leave the old social relations of the departure site behind and establish new ones in the destination site. Cresswell points out that movement involves time and space. This observation harkens back to my article, Gagaku in Place and Practice, where I talked about spatiality and temporality. Again, to exemplify these concepts using Gagaku, moving outside of Japan to America, for example, there is a traversal of space. Moving from Japan to Hawaii in the case of the University of Hawaii Gagaku group, or to California in the cases of the Kinada and Tinri Gagaku groups in Los Angeles and the Northern California Gagaku group in the Bay Area. Gagaku moving to America also marks the passage of time and raises the need to think about the temporality as now Gagaku is not, a simply, is not simply a practice engaged in Japan, but also engaged in the United States. When Shamoto Sensei traveled to Germany and helped establish the Kon Gagaku Ensemble, a new phase in the history of Gagaku began with that journey and a new Gagaku Ensemble in Europe. Finally, Questwell reminds us that movement involves desire, as people travel with the aim to do some action or actions in the destination site. In the case of Gagaku, the movement of instructors such as Shamoto Sensei and Togi Sensei was about traveling to locations, Hawaii, California, and Germany, and let me not forget New York and Columbia University's Gagaku Ensemble, but those involve the teachers from Degaksha. To establish groups that can engage in the practice of Gagaku on par with counterparts in Japan. The same can be said about the Shakuhachi instructors with Kasano's, within Kasano's article. Kasano, however, does not bring up this fact because he is not employing movement as I have been describing it here. He is presenting movement as it has been understood in the transnational discourse and focusing on the dissolution of that national border. It comes with the cost of not acknowledging the desires of the teachers to establish their practices in places outside of Japan. There's much more I could say about the movement of Gagaku and other traditional Japanese practices to America and beyond. But to try and keep this presentation within the time frame, I will move on to the conclusion. So let me return back to the titular question. Is traditional Japanese culture transnational? By posing this question and thinking through the way Gagaku has moved from Japan to America and Germany, it hopefully has become apparent that the definition of movement becomes a central issue. Movement as it is conceived in transnationalism and trans transnationalist discourse is often depicted as a to and fro movement that weakens the significance of a border. That is, the stronger and more frequent the movement across the border is, the weaker the significance of the border becomes. Movement that fits into this paradigm is privileged as the subject of study in transnationalist discourse. The movement of gagaku and other traditional Japanese cultural practices does not fit into this paradigm. The movement of Gagaku abroad has not necessarily weakened the significance of the border, but by focusing on the weakening of the national border, 
The larger transnational discourse is overlooking the fact that Gagaku and other Jap traditional Japanese cultural practices are moving with certain goals in mind. Furthermore, transnational discourse overlooks the ways in which the space changes as these practices move due to the creation of new communities of practice. With these new communities of practice, there are changes to the space or spatiality, if you go back to my article, the practice occupies. What I have, what I hope I have shown in my discussion of Iwabuchi and Kasano is the problems with trying to incorporate discussions of trans traditional Japanese practices into transnational discourse. And based on the, that discussion and how it does not accurately describe the movement of traditional Japanese practices outside of Japan, I argue that these practices are not transnational. To employ the adjective transnational leads to the focus of the significance of the border and leads to overlooking the ways in which gagaku and other traditional practices have moved from Japan. Furthermore, it overlooks the reason why it is so important to people such as Shamoto Sensei and Togi Sensei to bring these practices abroad, as well as how the space in which these practices operate changes as a result. If the goal of writing scholarship about gagaku is to accurately depict the spatiality and history while incorporating the communities of practices outside of Japan, then I would advocate for leaving the attempts to frame gagaku and other Jap traditional Japanese practices as transnational behind. With that, I thank you for listening to this presentation and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on these ideas in the larger discussion.